guys, I'm Biji and in this video we discuss the neat questions from the chapter Biomolecules. Alright, let's begin with a question from NEET 2018. A question that appeared in the NEET exam this year. The question is, the two functional groups characteristic of sugars are carbonyl and phosphate, carbonyl and methyl, hydroxyl and methyl, carbonyl and hydroxyl. First of all, to answer this question, you need to know what functional groups are. Functional group is a group of atoms that give the compound or the substance its characteristic property. For example, if an OH group is attached to a hydrocarbon, consider a simple hydrocarbon. It forms the simplest form of alcohol, which is methanol. So OH group is the functional group here and it gives the characteristic property to these compounds. Hydrocarbons that contain the OH group fall under the class of alcohols. So the question here is what are the functional groups that give the characteristic property to sugars? Let's consider one of the common sugars, glucose molecule. So this is the structure. This is the carbon backbone with six carbons. And it has a C double bond O in the first carbon. And it has many OH groups attached to the remaining carbons. And all the rest is made up by hydrogen. So this is the structure of a glucose molecule. So as you can see, this is a carbonyl group. Now this is one of the functional groups. And there are hydroxyl groups. So these two groups together form the functional groups of sugars. So your answer here is option number four, carbonyl and hydroxyl. Now this question is from NEET 2017. The question is, which of the following statements is correct with reference to enzymes? Options are hollow enzyme is equal to upper enzyme plus coenzyme. Coenzyme is equal to upper enzyme plus hollow enzyme. Hollow enzyme is equal to coenzyme plus cofactor. Upper enzyme is equal to hollow enzyme plus coenzyme. I've covered this topic in quite detail in my video, More Enzymes. You can check this out for a complete understanding. I shall just go into this briefly so that we can get to the answer. I talk about the mnemonic whole, which sounds like whole, W-H-O-L-E. Whole meaning complete. So the complete enzyme is the hollow enzyme. If you remember this part, you can easily rule out two of the options. Two and four. What remains is one and three. If you look at option three, this prefix co here usually means along with or in addition to. So both of it has the prefix co. So with that, you can actually rule this option out because you know the main part is missing. There's only the additional part here. So the answer has got to be option one. Hollow enzyme is equal to upper enzyme plus coenzyme. Moving on. The next question is also from NEET 2017. Which of the following are not polymeric? And the options are proteins, polysaccharides, lipids, nucleic acids. To answer this question, you need to know what a polymer is. Polymer is a large molecule that is made up of small repeating units. Is protein a polymer? Yes, it is a polymer of amino acids. There are about 20 different amino acids and different amino acids are put together one after another linked by a peptide bond to form a very long chain, which is what protein is. So this is a polymer polysaccharides, again a polymer, it is a polymer of sugar molecules or to be more accurate, monosaccharide units that are linked together by glycosidic bond forms a polysaccharide. So that's also a polymer. Nucleic acids are also polymers. They are polymers of nucleotides which are linked together by a phosphodiester bond. So your answer option is number three, lipids. So let's see how a lipid is not a polymer. So this is a 
triglyceride molecule, a common lipid, a basic lipid. So you have the glycerol molecule, which is then attached to three other fatty acids through ester bonds. So this is the structure of a lipid molecule. As you can see, it is a large molecule and it has many fatty acids, but they are not repeating and they are not linked together one after another by a specific kind of bond. They are all attached to a glycerol molecule and you can have only three or two fatty acids in a lipid molecule. So which makes this a very large molecule, but not a polymer. So your option here is number three, lipids. Let's go to the next question. This is a question from NEET 2016, which had two different exams. So this is the second exam. The question is, a non-proteinaceous enzyme is lysozyme, ribozyme, ligase, deoxyribonuclease. You pretty much need to know the answer here. Lysozyme is a proteinaceous enzyme which is found in lysosomes. Ligase and deoxyribonuclease are also proteinaceous enzymes. Most enzymes are proteinaceous enzymes. The only exceptions are RNA enzymes, which is what a ribozyme is. It is an RNA enzyme. So that is your answer. Okay, moving on. This is also a question from the same paper. Which of the following is the least likely to be involved in stabilizing the 3D folding of most proteins? And the options are hydrogen bonds, electrostatic interaction, hydrophobic interaction, yester bonds. Let's go into it one by one. First of all, hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are the bonds that form between hydrogen atom and an electronegative atom. Like in water, the bonding between hydrogen and the oxygen atom is a hydrogen bond. Electrostatic interactions are basically seen between positive and negative charge that is present on atoms. For example, sodium chloride. Sodium has a positive charge, chloride has a negative charge, and the attractive force between them is an electrostatic interaction. Hydrophobic interactions. These are basically interactions between non-polar groups and they interact to keep water out. So these three interactions are basically weak interactions and these are the forces that usually stabilize the 3D folding of proteins. Whereas an ester bond is a covalent bond and it is a bond between OH and an acid group. It basically removes water to form the ester bond. This is a rather strong bond and you don't see too many ester bonds in the 3D folding of proteins. So that is your answer. The next question is also from NEET 2016 paper 2. Which of the following describes the given graph correctly? And this is your graph. And the options are endothermic reaction with energy A in presence and B in absence of enzyme. Option two is exothermic with energy A in presence and B in absence of enzyme. Endothermic reaction with energy A in absence and B in presence of enzyme. And exothermic reaction with energy A in absence and B in presence of enzyme. I have explained this topic in quite a detail in my video, Enzymes. Do check that out for an in-depth understanding of this topic. Here, I shall merely try to answer this question. So if you look at the graph, you can see that the potential energy of the substrate is greater than that of the product, which means energy has been released during this reaction. And when energy is released, it's an exothermic reaction, which means you can rule out options one and three. This is not an endothermic reaction. So now to choose between option two and four. To do that, we have to look at A and B. A and B are activation energies. Now we need to know which is in the presence of an enzyme and which is in the absence. What do enzymes do? Enzymes basically act by reducing the activation energy. So logically, A should be in presence of the enzyme. 
So option two is your answer. It is an exothermic reaction with energy A in presence and B in absence of Nxi. All right, let's go ahead to the next question. Now this is also from 2016, but the first exam. A typical fat molecule is made up of one glycerol and one fatty acid molecule, three glycerol and three fatty acid molecules, three glycerol molecules and one fatty acid molecule, one glycerol and three fatty acid molecules. So let's take a look at a fat molecule to see what it is made up of. This is your typical fat molecule. As you can see, there's a glycerol molecule which is attached to three fatty acids through ester bonds. So this is your structure. Now going back to the answer, you get one glycerol and three fatty acid molecules. That is option four. Next question, also from the same paper. Which of the following statements is wrong? Uracil is a pyrimidine. Glycine is a sulfur containing amino acid. Sucrose is a disaccharide. Cellulose is a polysaccharide. Okay, let's look at these statements one by one. First of all, uracil is a pyrimidine. Pyrimidines are nitrogen bases. Basically, there are two types of nitrogen bases that are present in nucleic acids. The first is purines. So these are structures that have pyrimidine and an imidazole ring. So it's a two ring structure. And the examples for these are basically adenine and guanine. And the next group of bases that are found in nucleic acids are pyrimidines. Pyrimidines have only the pyrimidine ring structure. So it is a single ring structure. And the examples for these are thymine, cytosine and uracil. So uracil is indeed a pyrimidine. So that is a right statement. The next statement is glycine is a sulfur containing amino acid. So let's take a look at glycine. So this is what glycine looks like. As you can see, there is no sulfur here. It is the simplest form of amino acid with the R group being a hydrogen. So it has no sulfur. So that is a wrong statement. And therefore that is your answer. Let's just look at the other two statements to see how they are correct. Sucrose is a disaccharide. Of course, this is your sucrose molecule. You have glucose and fructose that are linked through a glycosidic bond. So you have two sugars, monosaccharides, one, two put together, you get a disaccharide. So that is a right statement. Then you have cellulose is a polysaccharide. Yes, cellulose is made up of repeating glucose units. So cellulose is a polysaccharide. That is also a right state. Okay, let's go ahead. Question from NEAT 2015. The chitinous exoskeleton of arthropods is formed by the polymerization of N-acetyl glucosamine, lipoglycans, keratin sulfate and chondroitin sulfate D-glucosamine. You pretty much have to know the answer here. Chitin is a polymer of N-acetyl glucosamine. I'll just go through the rest of the options just to explain what they are. Lipoglycans are basically lipids that are attached to sugars. Keratin sulfate and chondroitin sulfate are polysaccharides that are present in cartilages. And D-glucosamine is just glucose, uh, an amino group attached to a glucose molecule. The next question is also from NEED 2015. Which of the following biomolecules does have a phosphodiester bond? Amino acids in a polypeptide, nucleic acids in a nucleotide, fatty acids in a diglyceride, monosaccharides in a polysaccharide. Okay, let's go through each of these options and figure out which is the answer here. Amino acids in a polypeptide are basically bonded together through peptide bonds. So that is not your answer. Fatty acids in a diglyceride are bonded through ester bonds. So that is also not your option. Monosaccharides in a polysaccharide are bonded through glycosidic bonds. So the answer here 
will have to be option number two. Nucleic acids in a nucleotide and they are bonded through phosphodiester bonds. So NEAT 2015 also actually had two papers. The first paper, which was cancelled, that doesn't prevent us from going through those questions. Which one of the following statements is incorrect? The competitive inhibitor does not affect the rate of breakdown of the enzyme substrate complex. The presence of the competitive inhibitor decreases the KM of the enzyme for the substrate. A competitive inhibitor reacts reversibly with the enzyme to form an enzyme inhibitor complex. Competitive inhibitor is not chemically changed by the enzyme. This is also a topic I have discussed in quite detail in my video, Factors Affecting Enzymes. Do check that video out so that you know what all these terms mean and what a competitive inhibitor is and how it acts on an enzyme. Now let's just go through this to answer the question. The first option is the competitive inhibitor does not affect the rate of breakdown of the enzyme substrate complex. Now this is true because competitive inhibitor binds to the active site of the enzyme. They are basically competing with the substrate to bind to the site. If this enzyme substrate complex is formed, it means that the inhibitor has lost the race and the substrate has found the active site and the enzyme substrate complex has been formed. And now the inhibitor can do nothing to inhibit this. It is not involved in this reaction anymore and it has no effect on the enzyme substrate complex. All the action of a competitive inhibitor takes place initially before the binding. That is, if the inhibitor manages to acquire the enzyme, then the reaction will not take place. Whereas, if the substrate molecule has bound to the enzyme, then the reaction continues in a smooth manner. So, option one is not your answer. That's a correct statement. Let's go to the next one. The presence of the competitive inhibitor decreases the KM of the enzyme for the substrate. KM value is an inverse relation of the enzyme substrate affinity. So in presence of competitive inhibitor, the enzyme substrate affinity decreases. This is because there is another molecule that is competing for the active site, which means the KM value would increase. That is the affinity would decrease and the KM value would increase. Therefore, option two is your answer. But let's just look at option three and four and see how they are correct. A competitive inhibitor reacts reversibly with the enzyme to form an enzyme inhibitor complex. Yes, the enzyme inhibitor complex is also a reversible reaction. If you have a lot of substrate molecule, then it displaces the inhibitor and the substrate will bind to the enzyme and the reaction will proceed smoothly. Therefore, competitive inhibitor does interact reversibly with the enzyme. Competitive inhibitor is not chemically changed by the enzyme. This is also true. Although the competitive inhibitor binds to the enzyme active site, there is no reaction that will take place. Therefore, the competitive inhibitor is not chemically changed by the enzyme.